Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Film Forum at Home. My name is Joseph Berger, and I am the Theater Operations and Events Manager at Film Forum, an independent, not-for-profit, four-screen cinema in Manhattan's West Village. This year, 2020, celebrates Film Forum's 50th anniversary. I'm speaking to you all live from my office on West Houston Street. This is our sixth virtual event while the theater is temporarily closed. So first and foremost, we wish you all health and happiness at this time. We are very pleased to present on our virtual cinema platform, Jan Oxenberg's Thank You and Good Night. If you have yet to see the film, please consider renting it at filmforum.org. Half of that rental fee goes directly to the theater. First, a welcome to our members and friends joining our Zoom webinar. If at any point during the discussion you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and click on your Q&A icon on your Zoom window. This will enable you to submit your question in writing directly to our guest moderator, Winnie Holzman. Winnie will do her best to integrate your question into the conversation, so please keep them succinct and relevant. I'd also like to say hello to everyone watching our live stream on our YouTube channel, Film Forum NYC. Please take a moment and subscribe. Uh, our guest moderator tonight is Winnie Holzman. Winnie, come on in. There she is. Just unmute yourself and we're good. Hi, Winnie. Hi. Hi, everyone. Winnie is the book writer of the hit musical Wicked. She got her start in TV writing for the groundbreaking series 30-something and went on to create the series My So-Called Life, starring Claire Danes. She later executive produced Once and Again, as well as the ABC family series Huge with her daughter, Savannah Dooley. More recently, she collaborated with Cameron Crowe and J.J. Abrams on the Showtime series Roadies. Winnie is sometimes recognized as the chocolate-obsessed woman in the beloved film Jerry Maguire, and as Larry David's wife's therapist on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Winnie, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. And we're very pleased to have with us the director of Thank You and Good Night, Jan Oxenberg. Following a world premiere at Sundance, the film had its theatrical premiere at Film Forum on January 29th, 1992. Writing in the New York Times, Stephen Holden called it an innovative blend of cinema verite, drama, and comic surrealism. Although this was Jan's feature debut, she had previously made three short lesbian-themed films, including a comedy and six unnatural acts. Jan went on to write and produce a number of television dramas, including Relativity, Cold Case, Chicago Hope, and Once Again with Winnie. She wrote the first primetime lesbian kiss scene for Relativity six months before the Ellen Coming Out show and has written LGBTQ-themed storylines for every show she's worked on. She created a series of videos for the Hillary Clinton campaign that she says did not stop Putin from stealing the 2016 election. Thank You and Good Night has long been out of circulation, but happily, it's been restored by Indie Collect and comes out to our virtual cinema through distributor Janus Films. Ladies, I'm going to leave it up to you, and we Thank will you. see you in about 35, 40 minutes to say goodbye. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, you. hi, everyone, and hi, Jan. Um, we, um, Jan and I are close friends, and we've known each other for, I think it's a little over 25 years. And um, this is probably the first time we've had a conversation like this, where I have a list of questions for you. I don't think we've done that. but. Um, uh, usually at a time like this, my thought is that I'd be, I'd have helped you with your makeup beforehand because that's a big part of our friendship, right? Well, Winnie, um, yes, I, I think that, you know, to have the creator of Wicked and my show called Life helping me with my makeup has been one of the thrills of my life. Well, unfortunately, I couldn't do that today, although Obviously. you look gorgeous. Uh, so I knew you'd be wearing very little makeup, so I put on twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but we've, over the years, we've talked, as you know, we've talked a lot about writing. We've talked a lot about our projects. We've cried to each other. We've begged for help to each other. And we often have talked about, you know, where do I take this? How, what's the next step? So if you had known me back then, Back when you got your idea for 
a movie about your grandmother dying? What would you have bounced off of me? What what would you have what would you have said? Is it a documentary? Were you thinking of making a documentary? No, I I never had an idea of making a movie about my grandmother dying or making a documentary about my grandmother. And and I, I'd love it if you would talk about, you know, what happened when you first saw the movie, which was before we knew each other. But we'll, we'll get to that because, you know, I do want to talk a little bit about process. Um, a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, that it takes a lot of planning to be original. And sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's being open to the improvis improvisatory nature of life, to luck and randomness. I mean, in a way, this film started when I was 11, when a random, very bad thing happened, which was my little sister was hit by a car and killed. And it was a tragedy that struck my family. Um, and I was there, my, my brother was there as well. Uh, it, it was a trauma, you know, it, it probably- why, why do you say the, the film started there? I, unconsciously, you know, grappling with death, grappling with, uh, you know, people would try to comfort me. Oh, you should accept it. You should, you know, that happened for a reason. I would have wanted to kill those people. I thought it's bad enough it happened that, you know, don't tell me it happened for a reason. Right. And, uh, you know, many years later, my, I, I was in my 20s, uh, late 20s. I think my grandmother got diagnosed with breast cancer. I wanted to have her voice on tape. I went and did a little audio tape with her. She was very funny. She had been kind of taken for granted in the family, I would say. And she came alive when attention was paid to her. One thing led to another. I shot very little documentary footage with the kindness of many people who may be on this Zoom, the New York film community, who at that time, you know, we had an ethos. These things don't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an ethos of, I want to be a Hollywood writer. There was an ethos of, I want to do something transgressive. You know, we're here to do something different. That's the whole entire point. Okay. And so I did, you know, I shot very little documentary footage. And since I had never intended to make a documentary about my grandmother, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And in several years later, I wrote a script around it. I edited the documentary scenes on paper and put it into a script. So it looks like a regular script. And I decided there should be a cardboard cutout character of myself how, and how, how that, narrating it. How did that cardboard cutout get get born in your mind, do you think? Do you can you can you trace back your inspiration for that? Because that's yes. surely, I mean, that's, there's only, it, there's so many elements of the movie that are so original and, and emotional and surprisingly emotional, surprisingly funny, surprisingly devastating. But those, those cutouts, they're, they're incredible. They're so alive. You know, it's, I, I don't know the answer. I was, uh, I wrote, I wrote the movie, uh, my friend Carmen Goodyear had a, a, a goat farm near Mendocino and she's a painter and I used to go there and work on writing the script and I believe we smoked a lot of marijuana. I'm not sure exactly which elements the, uh, well, uh, I had seen a movie, called, I had seen a movie called Our Hitler by Hans Jürgen Cyberborg. Oh. This incredible seven-hour movie that is about how Germany got Hitler. We we may need a similar movie about Trump soon. And it had every film technique in the kitchen sink. You know, it had documentary footage, narrative footage, puppets, paper mache, and it didn't have any cardboard cutouts. But it it kind of opened up my mind to how a film that's a a meditation, really. You know, I had this experience. Some of it was documented. The film was a meditation on going through saying goodbye to someone you love. Right. And it, and it seemed like, I don't know, cardboard cutouts never die. You know, if I look at it 
if I look at it in retrospect and try to analyze it, what was the impulse for the cardboard cutouts? There were too many people dying in the movie. Cardboard cutouts never die. But also you were you you were enlisting your real family in the movie. So was it maybe a way to give a break <laughs> to to some of your family members so that they didn't have to carry all the all of the casting needs? Because Well, I mean, I didn't enlist them. They, uh, you know, they were there and they were, you know, were generous enough to just be themselves. Um, especially my brother, Ricky, who's a philosophy professor now, who, you know, is, t says things in an intense way that are very profound about death. Um, my brother, Danny, uh, he has one of my favorite lines in the movie. Um, we were eating dinner the night my grandmother died, and he said, and we're talking about how my mother didn't get to the hospital to see her that night, even though I had said, maybe you better go. And then she felt bad because she didn't go. And Danny said, well, no matter how many times you see her, it's still never going to be enough because you just can't, you just can't say goodbye, really. I mean, that's I really, that. is that, that's really one of the main unanswerable questions in the movie, I think, is how do you, how do you say goodbye? Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about it during this re-release and death is about love. You know, when you're confronted with losing someone, you have to think about what is the quality of how I loved this person. And that's what this movie really is about. Um, I do want to mention, not to leave out my sister, Julie, she didn't want to be in the movie that much. So mm -hmm. her main uh, her, her main appearance is playing Take the A Train on the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it is a it is a, a movie. It's not about your family only, but it is about this, like you say, this trauma that happened that that I understand that none of you had ever had ever talked about really. So this movie became a way for perhaps for you to for you, Jan, to bring up the subject that you'd never been able to talk about about Judy's death. You know, oddly enough, it was my grandmother who kept talking about Judy. It, it became my, uh, I was 11, she was seven. My parents uh, had twins, Danny and Julie, a year after Judy died. And uh, it just was the way then. We didn't, we never talked about it. Um, my grandmother would keep track of how long it had been since Judy had died. You know, there's a line in the film. Right. Oh, it's, you know, 15 years already, as if every year made it worse, not better. Right. And uh, it was, you know, writing, when I wrote this script, I found that I was able to, you know, when you, when you make something that comes out of personal material, I feel like you kind of have a responsibility to try to be honest, even if it doesn't make you look good, because what's the point if you're not being honest? Yeah. And so... I think I revealed things, you know, about my feelings about my family, good things that I had been too embarrassed to tell them. That's really, that's really beautiful. I mean, that's just really beautiful. Tell us some of the stories, because you've described this as guerrilla filmmaking, and I know you had like zero budget. So how did you get some of these, like, how did you, how did you get the amazing music that you have? in the movie <laughs> well um okay so i um i needed to get help have somebody to help me type the script uh, you know the personal computers were just coming in and and a wonderful woman named why sue thorpe uh answered an ad that she could help me type things up and she was a um she had been a housewife in nebraska and she had come to New York. Um, she was married to a minister. She had come to New York to be a bohemian and, and she was studying Buddhism. And she had gotten a job, I think, at MTV doing music rights. So when we wanted to get the rights to many popular songs, which were way, I mean, we had no money, we're way out of our budget, it was impossible. She called all these you know, Warner Music and all of them, and told them how important the movie was and so on. And they said, well, you know, how are you getting paid? And she said, well, 
I'm studying to be a Buddhist monk and I've taken a vow of poverty. And the guy said, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I thought I had heard everything. That's the first time <laughs> I heard that one. So he gave us all the music for paper awesome. you know, nations for a price we could afford. And tell that amazing story that you told me about when you wanted the shot at the grave at at, at your grand, at, at the graveside in the cemetery. And well, how you got that. Because I think it's inspiring to young filmmakers and, and to any filmmaker. The, the ingenuity and the and also the, the good luck that has to that has to rain down sometimes, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure this is good luck, but we had no money. I mean, you know, the film was, it got grants, you know, I would, I would, I had the script, I would shoot a little bit, we had shot the documentary footage, I had a sample reel. So uh, we wanted to shoot a scene where the uh, cutout is in a grave and we called the cemetery and the guy said, we could open a grave, it'll cost you a thousand dollars. And we didn't have a thousand dollars. So he called back the next day, said, listen, if somebody dies and there's a funeral in the <laughs> afternoon, you guys could come in the morning and we'll only charge you three hundred and fifty dollars. So I said, "Fantastic!" So thematic. It's, it's perfectly thematic. It was our lucky day. He called in the morning. I call everybody, wonderful volunteers working for free or nothing. Hey, come on! We go to the cemetery. You know, we set up. We have the cutout in the grave. Now their grave digging machine had broken. So there was an actual man finishing digging the grave. He's in the movie. Right. But it was taking a little longer. So we put the cutout in the grave. We're shooting. We got the lights, the camera, everything. And somebody drives up and says, the funeral is here. <laughs> I felt horrible. you know. I don't know how long I can hold them at the gate. We grabbed the cutout out of the grave. You know, We try to hide the camera stuff behind a tree. The funeral drives up. And thank God they thought it was hilarious. It's like Grandpa Max would love this. His grave is going to be in a movie. It all feels like part of the movie. It's all because your grandmother did love being being photographed, correct? Well, yes. I mean, you know, we, we one thing we did, we shot her. She was on her way to have a radiation treatment. She had breast cancer. And she says, oh, they must have thought I was some celebrity coming down the hall. You know, she said, I said, Grandma, you, you're really a ham. She says, that I know, but a kosher one. <laughs> and uh, even on the last day of her life, I said, she said, bring the cameras. You know, don't come visit me. But if you do, don't forget to bring the cameras, bring the film, bring everything. Don't forget. I think she was talking about herself. People want to be known. People want to be remembered. And I think we were able to give her that, even though, you know, there are moments in the film, believe me, that are hard for me to watch when she's in discomfort. Pain control wasn't as good then. Right. And it was, you know, a decision about whether to put that. It, 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 was, it was hard to be with her. You know, filming became... It, it was kind of a crutch, you know, it, it, it helped me get past the instinct to leave, to say, oh, you must be tired, because that was her. She didn't have a choice. Right. That was her. And that was her disability at the end of her life. And, but she was herself right up to the end. And I feel like she didn't, she died less alone because we were there for her. And she said, it's not in the film, but she said to me skeptically, you know, because people would take little home movies. And she, uh, how often are you going to take these movies out and show them? And she'd be pretty surprised, I guess. This is, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I mean, you must be pretty surprised. I know. It's an amazing thing to have a re-release. And I keep thinking about the time when you made the movie, which was the time of AIDS and the AIDS crisis and the time that we're in now, which is this other devastating health crisis. And both of these two situations test you so strongly spiritually and in e emotionally and physically and in every way. Um, and it's an odd and fascinating coincidence, don't you think, that this is when your movie comes back, when people are really 
facing their own mortality in a in a almost in your face kind of way and and their loved ones mortality yes i am the plague filmmaker um <laughs> And Hitler was such a, though not a great person, uh, was so so good to you because he, uh, well, not Hitler himself, but that movie was so inspiring for you. So even Hitler. Well, yes, fascism. No, but seriously, look, this is a movie that, you know, I used to joke, this movie has every word in its description that would make somebody not want to see a movie, including me. You know, <laughs> grandma, cancer, dying, documentary, now has cachet, but back then it didn't. Cardboard. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, who's it starring? Who's in it? Oh, a cardboard cutout. <laughs> um, you know, great people in the Königsberg, I, I be on the Zoom, you know, made those cardboard cutouts, poor Paula. She had no idea it was going to take so many years to film it because of raising money. She kept trying to quit, but we couldn't find anyone who could make them as well. You know, and the great thing is that we could put them in the closet and when we were ready to film again, there they were. They weren't off on another acting job. So that was serendipity, but death doesn't go out of style. You know, no. our... our our clothes, our hairdos may have gone out of style, but sadly, death doesn't, and love doesn't, and the struggle of letting go and saying goodbye. I mean, when my, I just, my film has an attitude. My film has an attitude. I'm not trying to help you accept death. Death happens. You don't have a choice, but fuck death. That's my film's attitude. <laughs> You know, the cardboard cutout is saying, I didn't like it that grandma died. Right. She's trying to thwart it at every turn. No, she's, she's scowling and angry through most of the movie, I think. Um. Well, she's, I mean, the movie is funny. You know, it's very funny because partly our Jewish family deals with pain and every other emotion by being funny. But also, I mean, what can you do but laugh? It's futile. You know, it's kind of. It's, she, we're moving the furniture out, finally, of my grandmother's apartment. And the cardboard cutout is trying to move the furniture back in and and have a place where grandma will always be. But, you know, look, I'm not, spoiler alert, she dies and spoiler alert, you can't do anything about it. But. It's something that we all experience and it's a meditation on that. And it asks the unanswerable questions. You know, some of them are about family. Why didn't grandma teach my mother how to cook? Some of them are about life. Why do people have to die anyway? I have a question from Gildas Wurman. I wonder if the counterculture of the 1950s and the early 60s influenced Ms. Oxenberg's sensibility as a filmmaker. Well, what were uh, your influences besides I, Hitler? Besides I, I, <laughs> I learned to read with Mad Magazine. Um, you know, I had a satiric sensibility. Uh, of course, the counterculture. Yeah, I was, uh, I made lesbian movies, but, you know, when that wasn't as cool as it is today. Um, being transgressive, as I said, you know, wanting to make a new world, not wanting to join the world that exists. Yes, ironically, making this movie <laughs> led to my having a career in TV. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that, Winnie, because that... Well, I know, believe it's all Jason Kadem's fault, and I think we blame him for your TV career um, and film career. No, um, the, the way that I met you, as you well know, is I was doing my so-called life. Jason was working with me on that show, and Jason had met you in Sundance, correct? The Sundance Writers Lab, right. right. I, I was there with another film I wanted to write and direct, and they showed Thank You and Good Night there. And Jason and Matt Reeves were there with right. a feature film called The Paul Bearer. Right. And Jason brought your film to me. Before I even met you, I, I mean, your film brought us together, Jan, right? Um, he brought the film and he said, you should take a look at this. And uh, this is this incredible woman I met. And I, I remember um, 
just sobbing at your movie. Now, yes, your movie is hilariously funny. There's no question. And also, I'm from Long Island, too. So um, there was a lot of connection I felt just viscerally. Um, but the amount of emotion that that it built that it builds to really took me by surprise. Um, and I, I've never forgotten just that very, I've seen it many times since, but that very first time seeing it so emotional. Um, I think it's what you were saying before. It's like, if you're going to do something personal, be naked. Why not be naked? Of course, you put things, you put things, you put structures in place. So you felt safe. You felt safe to be naked, if you know what I mean. And um, I'm I getting just, a little anxious, but I think <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. I didn't mean to say the word naked eight times. I really, really, don't, really didn't. I'd like to tell you that story, like from my point of view. So I made this movie. I was so broke. I mean, I was living in Park Slope in Brooklyn. You know, I had been doing crazy things to keep going while I was making the film. I transcribed Rudy Giuliani's undercover mafia tapes when he was with the Manhattan DA's office. I, oh, come on. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Um, you know, I cleaned people's houses, like, really badly. I did anything and begged for money from everywhere. Um, your collaborator on Wicked, Stephen Schwartz, I found out, was on an early New York State Council on the Arts panel that gave the film a grant. I mean, so many people here. I just want to say thank you to all of you. Okay, so um, I was uh, I was very broke, and the film was a success at Sundance. It got a distributor, Paul Cohen and Aries Film. It got I got an agent. Um, anyways, and. I was at the Sunday. So when Jason took the movie to you, I had I knew nothing about television, but it sounded like a great thing. And he said, maybe Winnie will hire you. And I was like, oh, my God, that would be so amazing. And he went back. It was so generous of Jason to show you the movie and ask you. And then he came back to me and he said, well, Winnie said she really loves the movie. But, you know, hiring you for a TV show would be like putting a bird in a cage. And I'm like, is the rent on the cage paid by any chance? Well, and what a, what a lot like of was the best backhand compliment I ever got. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. I mean, we got a whole friendship out of it. And yes. and it's not just an an ordinary friendship because I think not that there's any ordinary friendship, but we do use each other quite a lot to foster and promote each other's different creative projects that we're working on. So we um you know, we only worked together that officially that one time on Once and Again, but I think of us as working together a lot because we are so, we use each other for for help, basically, for, for guidance and for to bounce ideas off of. Um, I'm wondering if there's another I, question I should ask. Let me just take a look. Um, well, you know, I'd like to say that film... And this film certainly doesn't, none of it happens in a vacuum. I mean, it happens, you know, creatively out of a community of people who have an intention. Um, for example, James Seamus uh, was the co-producer on the movie. And, uh, you know, he helped me see the role of my sister's death, which, you know, had really kind of been buried in the script. He helped me bring that out. Um, Everybody was skeptical about it. Uh, Lynn Holst uh, was working for American Playhouse and Sandra Schulberg. Lynn what came and what I did finally, here's what I did. I, cause, cause I had this documentary scenes and I had some of the scripted scenes shot and I had a script, but still nobody believed it would work. So I put it all together and I put black leader over the scenes that remained to be shot and over those scenes, I read the script. So I invited Lynn to come to an editing room and I showed it to her the way it would work as a movie with the scenes that were missing read and then the scenes mm -hmm. that I had edited. And she went back to Lindsay Law and convinced him to have American Playhouse finance the movie along with POV, Mark Weiss, and 
And that's how the film got finished. And it was serendipity because that could have easily not happened. Yeah, but I mean, you were you were driven to 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 express what what was in your mind, what you were seeing. You you knew on some. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you you knew on some level that it could work. Some part of you knew, right? Yes, I knew. I mean, it took you know, it actually took twelve years from when I first interviewed my grandmother to when I figured out what it was and wrote a script <laughs> right. to when it finally got financed and shot and premiered at Sundance. You know, I was, and yes, I believed all during that time that it would work. And, you know, just to be encouraging to other people, you know, now I'm I'm on the board of the Writers Guild Foundation. We met, mentor veterans who want to have writing careers and so on. And everybody's like, what do, what do people want? What should we do to, you know, I'm not saying make a movie about your grandmother dying, starring a cardboard cutout. That's the shortest path to get, you know, a job in Hollywood. But but in a way it is, in a way, doing whatever you can do to make your original voice, whether it's on paper or in digital, it's so much easier to make things now. Mm -hmm. Manifest your original voice. And there's also this thing that I think about a lot lately, which is that in any creative pursuit in any creative project there are times and sometimes I've experienced there's multiple times but there's always one time at least where it appears that the entire project has fallen apart and is on and it will not continue and is useless basically it's not going to be born or however you would put it and I think that's a that's an that that is a, a time when when some people do give up, understandably, because it's it's very frightening. But that that is a normal part of of the creative process. That if you don't give up, some new insight and new energy does come. That's that's my experience. You just have to live through the <laughs> the horrible dark night of the soul when you think it was all for naught. And I don't usually say naught, but I. <laughs> Well, not. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I'll tell you one story since you brought up Hitler. I was desperate. I can't to- help it. I, it's, he's in the air. He is. Uh, okay. So, you know, there were European television at that time often financed American independent films. And I had the chance to get money from German television. And I really needed the money, and I was waiting to hear. I was going to hear the next day whether they were going to give me the money. But I was feeling kind of a little guilty because although my grandmother herself wasn't in the Holocaust, she her family had come earlier, but certainly relatives of theirs perished in the Holocaust. And, you know, it was, I mean, she literally would whisper when she talked about being Jewish, even here. So I thought, oh, my God, you know, how would grandma feel if she but her film was being financed by German television. All right, so the night before I was going to hear the answer, I had a dream that Hitler was still alive and I had his phone number. And I called him up. And it turned out he wasn't such a bad guy after all. This is true. This was like the, the soul of an independent filmmaker. Like, really? Ready to get Hitler to finish making the movie. It's really, I can tell it's true. It's, very, it's all too true. Um, let me see. Just do, are there? Oh, look! Now there's a lot of questions. I'm going to look again. Um, do you think there's a lot of money or a lot of artistic reward which can translate into a lot of money if you stick to it? If you stick to that? Oh, do oh! I, 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 I let wait. I left out something important. It says, "To thine own self be true." To thine own self be true. Do you think there's a lot of money or a lot of artistic reward which can translate into a lot of money if you stick to that? Do I think there's a lot of money? No. <laughs> there might be. You know, it's uh, you. I mean, I mean, clearly you are not making this movie going. I just know I'm going to make a lot of money. I was not. You know, look. I mean. There are formulas for what works commercially. 
there's a lot of uh, new venues for people to make movies and TV shows. And, uh, you know, I, I have no idea how what to thine own self be true, you know, might line up with commercial success. But I don't think starting out intending to make money necessarily leads to making money or being true to thine own. I, I agree. I also think that it's through my experience is that it's through writing and writing, writing various things that I figure out who my, my own self even is. I mean, I don't, I don't know how I personally don't know how I would have, and not that I'm, I'm real clear who I am all the time, but I, I, I discover what I even think or what I even feel while, while writing. So. Yes. That is very much how this movie came into being. I went through an experience of saying goodbye to my grandmother, who I wasn't as present with. You know, I left home. I moved to California. I wasn't close. I had never told her I was a lesbian, though she probably knew. She was more of a feminist than I ever knew. I probably alienated myself from my family more than I needed to out of fear that they would reject me, even though they didn't. So, you know, making this film was a way not only of reconnecting with my family, but also of figuring out what I had to say about being a, a person who had experienced death in, in a tragic violent way as a child and in a completely normal way as an adult. We all lose parents, grandparents, siblings. And it was a way of me figuring out what I had to say about that and saying it. And do you feel like your your feelings or your attitude toward death, if this if this is a question I saw in the in the QA, do you feel like those feelings have altered at all or, or transformed as you've gotten older? Well, that's interesting because, you know, there's a part in the film where the cutout lies on a therapist's couch. <laughs> it's, it's so, that's one of the most adorable <laughs> images in the film. Be very, you know, the therapist's voice to perfection. If you don't close the door, you can't open the door. Letting go doesn't mean, it means you're putting them into memory. You know, the, the importance of letting go obviously allows us to go on with life and we kind of have no choice. But, um, you know, I don't, I was very angry when my sister died. I felt like, no. I don't, accepting death felt like an insult to her. Mm. And now, you know, there's another line in the film that says, uh, my mother and I walk into my grandmother's apartment to start packing it up and there's narration that says, well, now there's just my mother between me and death. Well, unfortunately my mom died last year at age 94, died young, she was still going strong. So now there ain't my mother between me and death. And the whole world is having a consciousness, whether we think about it every day or not, whether we're thinking about, you know, how Trump has made masks into a culture war and we're turning into fascism and how could people not care that 200,000 people are dying? I mean, all of these political things. But nevertheless, whether you're wearing a mask or not, no matter what side of this culture war you're on, you are thinking about death. Right. Right. And it's terrifying. You know, it's so I'm not sure, you know, I call it the unanswerable questions. Thank you and good night is a meditation on it. I certainly don't have the answers. And do I accept it more? And do I see the value of letting go? Yes. And no. <laughs> 
you want to give some some advice to young guerrilla filmmakers? I would like to say one more thing about this. Sure. You know, when my sister died, lying there in the street, it was, you know, traumatic to see her lying in a pool of blood, literally. And I felt like, you know, what we get to do is make meaning out of this. The idea that it had meaning, that God did it for some reason, didn't appeal to me personally. That wasn't a comfort to me. It is to many. What was a comfort to me was the idea that we get to make meaning out of that and make art or make love or make family or whatever kind of meaning we get to do, that that's, that's what it is for us. That's so important and profound to me. And I feel like it is answering the question of advice to young guerrilla filmmakers because that's what you, that can be your North Star. That, I mean, there's, I've had advice in my life where I've, I had somebody who I admired said, say, write something that will change your life. And I had another person later who I admired also who said, write something that scares you. And it, stri it strikes me that you did both. You, you wrote something that changed your life. I mean, those 12 years, you, were, you, you evolved into a filmmaker and you evolved into a person who could go to Sundance and meet, meet and you know, go to LA and start a whole other career. I mean, you, that, and, and, and in more internal ways, the movie, more, more emotional ways, I'm sure the movie completely transformed a lot of your life. But also, you were facing something that, you were facing your fears in making that movie. I feel it is the responsibility of an artist or a writer you know, if you're going to use personal material, it's your responsibility to make it entertaining yes. and emotional enough to earn other people's time in watching it. That's really well put. I, I hope somebody out there was writing that down. That was good. Um, I agree. And it's not easy. And, you know, I have... Letting go wasn't a big skill in my family. <laughs> so I didn't let go of making the movie, you know, <laughs> parallel. I didn't have much documentary footage that kind of paralleled the experience of someone dying and you don't have enough time with them. You didn't get to say this or that. And we didn't get to shoot this or that. Necessity was the mother of invention. That's why this film exists because I didn't have any money to make a documentary. There was no documentary crew following us around. We did some recreations where you see the cutout seems to be there while the documentary footage is happening. Don't tell anybody. But uh, there wasn't actually a rocket ship taking off from my mother's staircase while we were sitting in Shiva, believe it or not. Oh, man. Okay, well, I feel like you... I hope people feel like I answered... I asked the right questions. Can I just tell one more story? Because in honor of my mother, who I really miss. Yes, yes, of course. She ended up writing an advice column. Her motto was, take my advice, I'm not using it, which was kind of true. Okay, so my mother was so cooperative. I mean, in the movie she said, Jan, can we get this over with already, please? But I told her to say that. <laughs> and she didn't have to do a lot of research, but she... So here's, I just want to end with this one story. So oh. I wanted to shoot a scene where there was a lot of dirt on the grave, you know, because I'd seen they put these huge piles of dirt and I thought it was very dramatic looking. For whatever reason, on my grandmother's grave, there was a very paltry amount of dirt. So first we went to the cemetery with a pail and a shovel and some friends, but we couldn't get enough dirt there. So I asked my mother if she wouldn't mind calling the cemetery and telling them that she was very upset that there wasn't <laughs> enough dirt on her mother's grave. And that she knew her mother would be very upset to feel that her grave had less dirt than everybody else's. And my mother said, they're going to think I'm crazy. And I said, yes, 
You have to make them think you're crazy and tell them that we're coming next week. You're bringing everybody. So they have to do this. Oh, my gosh. And she did it. She did it. That, and talk about love. She did it out of pure love and belief and faith in you. That reminds me of this thing that I've seen you say before about the movie that I really relate to, which is that in the movie, there's these three generations of women and your mother didn't want to be her mother, your grandmother. She didn't want to grow up to be your grandmother and you didn't want to grow up to be your mother. But you got to do this thing that neither your grandmother or your mother could ever have could ever have done. They just, it wasn't in their world. Well, that's right. Talk about feminism. You know, my grandmother, I found out, resented the fact that she had to change her name when she got married. I had no idea. She was much more of a feminist than I ever knew. My mother was an extremely talented writer who didn't as easily have the opportunities that I had. And I had the opportunities that I had and were still fighting for women's place in the world. And uh, keep fighting. Well, that's a, that's a great place to, to end, I think. I, I hope that, um, oh, hi. Hi, Joe. You know, this was our sixth virtual event and I think it was my favorite. So you I, say that to everyone I know. I'm, I have I'm anyway, you, can go, but... you can go on our YouTube channel and see that this is the first time I've said this. This was a really, um, oh, it was really be beautiful conversation. So I want to oh. thank you guys so much for um, speaking so eloquently about so much. And um, I always, I do wrap usually with this um, question to both our moderator and our guest. I was wondering if you guys are working on anything right now, if you have anything down the pike. But also has the situation we've been in for the last six months um, influenced how you're working right now or what you're working on? Do you want to start, Jen? Oh, what am I working on? Hey, check back in 12 years. <laughs> no, I hope not. Can't go on having that timetable. Um, but I am stubborn about, you know, I have some uh, uh, TV shows, actually, and movies, scripts that, you know, haven't gotten made yet, They're hoping to get a little boost from this. Um, uh, so I, you know, Winnie and our friend Jason, when we saw the movie last year, we kind of talked a lot about how to be really original in our work and, and inspiring each other to do that. And I'm working on trying to I'm actually also hoping to make a short feature documentary weird thing to go along with the, I'm very grateful to Criterion when they release it on Blu-ray. I'm going to do a little extra thing, updating it. And I also just want to thank the Film Forum. This movie premiered at the Film Forum and I'm very mm -hmm. grateful that you showed it this week. That's thrilling. And, she, and Joe was asking, how has... Has the pandemic, um, our current situation, influenced your your creative life or your thoughts? Well, I I thought I, I've learned to cook a few things. <laughs> I'm very I'm I'm proud of that. You know, we're, we're all going to find out how it's influenced our creative life. I don't think we know yet. I don't think we know, but I know that life is is never going to be the same. That's what I believe. I think that this is huge and deep, profound, cataclysmic. And a lot, a lot of it has to do with, um, with, 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 with deep grief. And so I think it actually does dovetail with your movie because it's not something you can analyze or understand when you're deep in the middle of it. I think Grief is something that you 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 come to understand as you live it. Winnie, you're doing incredibly exciting things. You know, why don't you tell people about a couple of them? Well, they're not all re real, <laughs> but um, I'm I'm writing two different projects with my daughter Savannah Dooley. We're writing a movie for Netflix and um, hope what will hopefully be a limited series for Showtime. 
adapted from a novel by Joyce Carol Oates called A Book of American Martyrs. And uh, it's a beautiful, very ambitious, um, huge novel. And uh, I'm also working on the movie of Wicked in an ongoing way, so. And I'm also cooking a lot more, a lot more. Bye. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> thank you so much. Everyone here who Yeah, made thank it you for possible. coming. I love you. Everyone who was interested enough to come see it. I love you too. <laughs>